everybody and welcome. Thank you for connecting with us. I'm Alan from ISWA and I'm introducing today's webinar on Masterclass EPR, Country Case Studies, Best Practices. Thank you for connecting with us from around the world. Over 300 people registered from almost 50 countries for this webinar. We will be joined today by five experts on EPR who will share some of their experiences and insights about different case studies in countries applying EPR schemes. If you have any questions during our speakers' presentations, you are encouraged to type your questions in the questions window to your right. You can also upvote the questions you like. We will be choosing a few for the speakers to answer at the end. This webinar is a continuation of a series of webinars jointly organized by the International Solid Waste Association, the Extended Producer Responsibility Alliance, and the Product Stewardship Institute to explain the concept of extended producer responsibility and its various applications, as well as diving into current trends and future outlooks. I would also like to take a brief moment to introduce ISWA here, as several of you joining today are not yet members. The International Solid Waste Association is a global, independent, and non profit making association working in the public interest and is the only worldwide association promoting comprehensive and professional waste management and the transition to a circular economy. We are open to individuals and organizations, members from the scientific community, public institutions, and public and private companies from all over the world working in the field of waste management or interest in waste management. ISWA is the only worldwide waste association that enables its members to network with professionals, companies, and institutional representatives. ISWA's mission is to promote and develop sustainable and professional waste management worldwide. We have members from over 100 countries. We count on the support of our members. So if you're not yet a member, please take a moment to visit our membership page by visiting the link on the screen. Or you could also reach out to our membership manager, Mr. Daniel Purchase, by writing to him at thepurchase.iswa.org. We, we have flexible membership options with discounts for students, low-income countries, and online members. I'd like to give now the floor to Mr. Joachim Quoden from Expra, who will be moderating this webinar from now on. Thanks. Thank you very much, dear Alan. Well, warm welcome from Cologne from the afternoon in Cologne to the rest of the world. Thanks a lot for joining us. And uh, we are very happy in Expo that we are able to, to host uh, together with our partners this uh, we webinar, as Alan said, it's the fourth one of a series of several ones uh, in the past. We have concentrated on some uh, basics and hot, hot topics like the fee, fee mo modulation and competitive issues. Nowadays, uh, today, we want to go a little bit more into real life, into practice. So what have uh, various countries made out of the concept of e EPR? And that's uh, one of the, the mission of EXPRA in general. Uh, that we have to to share and to discuss the experience, the failures, the successes uh, within our membership, but of course with all the other partners around the world as well. And we are very ha happy that uh, we have currently 26 uh, producer responsibility organizations within our al alliance from 24 countries, not only from U Europe, we have a member in Canada as well, but also members in Turkey and Israel. And we are uh, we have just concluded a partnership uh, agreement with industry colleagues in Chile because they are at the moment in the phase of setting up a producer responsibility organization. And of course, we would like to support them as much as possible. Um, as I said, a E EPR is, is a concept, not a concrete business plan. So uh, if you approach me, I'm not able to, to, to send, send you a 100 page business plan that you just have to copy and paste into your, into your situation. Uh, this is on one side difficult, but on the other side, it, it allows really for the adoption of the specific local circumstances of your need of your, your wishes. So even more, we need to understand uh, what is EPR, how it is working, what is working, what is not wor wor working, where 
we should look for harmonization. Where can we work together, look for synergies, uh, and uh, who are the leaders and who are the front ra 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 runners? That's why we are organizing the, the, this. And you can see the variety of ways of EPR if, if you have a look to the different countries. Somehow everything is possible uh, at the mo moment where in industry is in the lead uh, with one single PRO or countries with 10, 20, 40 P PROs like in Poland, uh, full responsibility, shared responsibility, it, 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 etc. That's why we, we have chosen to today uh, several very u unique models. So. Solu solutions that we will try to present you with our first speaker from Ca Canada, jo jo John Coyne, who is uh, uh, the mastermind behind uh, Canadian industry and EPR, and he will present you the various so solu solution that his uh, organization CSSA is ma uh, mastering. Then we will move back to Europe, to one of our uh, oldest and most successful systems in it Italy, Coconai, with their uh, unique um, implementation uh, with a single uh, producer responsibility organization, single but several. You will learn uh, the details la later. And finalizing with our friends from Bulgaria, who where the government had decided to accredit several PROs, and they are trying to, ma to master the situation despite uh, the competition uh, on the steering level. I think that's a good choice to give you a real uh, insight what is possible, where are the benefits, where are the shortfalls, so that if you think to design your EPR system, uh, you can learn a lot, a lot from. Uh, not to forget my, in brackets, uh, ISWA working group, Governance and Legal Issues, where we are trying to establish the dialogue, not only on EPR, but of course concentrated on EPR in a broader context, because EPR is just one tool for municipal waste management. There are several other waste streams that are impo important to be tackled, and only if you tackle all of them in the best way, you get the best results. I would like to highlight our library on, e, on, on e, EPR, where you can find at the moment 26 very high-level contributions contributions from various people from all over the world that they have with extended producer responsibility. So if you are a member of, of ISWA, please join my working group to discuss further. Now I would like to pass the floor to John and uh, we are very keen to learn more about the experiences in Canada because especially in Canada you are as crazy as we are in the European Union. You decided or uh, because of your co constitution the provinces have the right to decide how to organize waste management, so the right to decide how to organize EPR and of course uh, your provinces have more or less decided to use it differently province by pro province, which is a cha challenge for industry, of course. John, the floor is yours. Thank you. Joachim, thank you very much. And the fact that you know as much about our constitution should enable you in subsequent discussions to perhaps lead this discussion for Canada. But thank you for that introduction. And Alan and uh, Iswa, thank you as well. And Scott at PSI for helping to organize this dialogue. I'm hoping that when we get to the end of these very short presentations that there will be a number of questions uh, that you will direct towards us because as Alan and, and Joachim have pointed out, EPR really is, it's a concept. It is not uh, something that we can draw a very clear line for you in terms of the types of programs available. It is a concept and it needs to be applied in accordance with the usual rules in whatever jurisdiction we're referring to. In Canada, we are certainly seeking to be nationally consistent, but also very locally specific so that we can tap in to the jurisdictional requirements, but also the local expertise in all jurisdictions in Canada. Today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, Canadian Stewardship Services Alliance. We are the largest uh, compliance organization in North America for printed paper and packaging. Spent a couple of minutes on that, but I really want to just focus uh, most of the few minutes today on the landscape for producer responsibility to talk a little bit about shared responsibility and full producer responsibility. And I know Joachim and others and Scott will talk about that as well. 
I'm going to use Recycle British Columbia, Recycle BC, as the example uh, of what we consider to be uh, an appropriate type of EPR program. And here I'm not talking about whether or not it operates in a competitive or a different type of framework, just to try to get the features of the program before you. I'm going to talk a little bit about the essentials of an, uh, of an effective EPR program and then comment very quickly at the end, which I, is an area that I hope will stimulate more questions on what this all means for the developing agenda and the terminology that we're using for a circular economy. Um, uh, we were incorporated in 2012 to provide administrative and management services common to EPR programs across Canada. This was important for businesses who were looking for scale, for synergy, and for single management approaches for these very complicated obligations across different jurisdictions. And so what we were set up to do was to provide a, a single window of compliance for businesses operating across Canada. We can do that in both official languages. We can do that for stewards who are um, operating in British Columbia all the way to the Atlantic coast. We also design and implement and support EPR programs directly. We are the primary interface for over 3,000 businesses in this country. So we have a robust set of systems and capabilities and talents within the organization to support EPR programs that have spending in excess of $300 million in this country. We have an extensive array of knowledge. And as you develop knowledge in this area, the important feature that I want to make sure that we touch on, and Joachim uh, started to address this, this is a process of continual learning. We are still evolving in the space of EPR, in the frame of waste management, in the frame of eliminating waste. So as we think about the kinds of services that you see described on this slide, we are all learning as we go. Now that said, we need to make sure that we are in instituting the appropriate kinds of practices and procedures and rules and regulations. But I wanna emphasize, and I hope this is clear to all of us who participate in this space, that being flexible and understanding that the world is going to evolve in this area is a key feature of how we think about EPR and obligations in this area. Now, Producer responsibility in Canada. As you can manage, the federal government does not have jurisdiction for waste management in this country. There is no national program or approach for waste management across the length and breadth of this country. Rather, provincial governments in the Federation and our Federation have direct responsibility for recycling services. So there is no harmonization across programs. Now that is at odds with what my company is trying to do. Our small population, moreover, is spread across a very, very immense landscape. Most of it very close to the US border, but many people as well scattered across further northern and western and eastern heritage areas. It's currently impossible with the regulatory landscape in this country to achieve economies of scale or drive us effectively and quickly towards a circular economy due to that fragmented approach. We're working on that and we're encouraging both federal and provincial officials to adopt a more common approach to the regulatory systems that they are trying to implement. Now, even though the federal government does not have direct responsibility for waste management in this country, the federal government is also taking action to support provinces and territories in this area. As the G7 host in 2018, Canada created and championed the Oceans Plastics Charter, raising the awareness of the plastics challenge globally, but particularly for Canadians and others in North America. The federal government has also authored the Canada-wide action plan for zero plastic waste. So while it's not interfering in waste management operations at a provincial level, it is trying to set the stage and try to set the framework, if you will, for how it is that we will address issues such as a single-use plastics ban. What will that mean and what will be included in that? Working to justify plastics in Canadian terminologies as toxic, and that's a specific feature of the Canadian Environmental Protection Act that allows the federal government to work with provinces and with industry to design management systems 
for those plastics. It may not be a ban, but it may reinforce how it is that we improve and extend recycling systems. The federal government is committed to designing an integrated waste management system for the country. So they're stepping into this space, but trying to make sure that they maintain the jurisdiction to which they are constitutionally entitled. Hopefully we will continue that dialogue in this country so that we can set appropriate targets for both plastics collection and recycling, and that we can move to a more harmonized system for recycled content requirements. This is going to be particularly important in a North American context, because not only because of the COSMA free trade agreement, it is absolutely vital that we think about our supply chains on a reasonable regional basis in North America, much the same way that we do in Europe, for example. All right. So the Canada-wide Action Plan for Zero Plastic Waste recognizes that EPR programs are one of the most effective mechanisms to support the creation of a circular economy. This helps to improve recycling rates and reduce litter and so on. So we will continue to pursue activities with the federal government and as industry, we will continue to pursue the Canada Plastics Pact, which is about to launch in this country. Now, there are two different types of systems that we look at in Canada. One is shared municipality, shared responsibility with municipalities, and one is full producer responsibility. There's only one full producer responsibility system for printed paper and packaging, and that is our program in British Columbia, which I'll come to in a moment. But again, emphasizing this um, theory, if you will, or at least this encouragement that we should remain flexible in terms of how we think about EPR, it is very important that we highlight the distinction between shared responsibilities and the effectiveness of those systems to create markets for materials and a full producer responsibility system such as we have in British Columbia. We believe that British Columbia, the program of full producer responsibility is the way forward into the future. We have the statistics that we believe prove the case, not only in terms of how it is that we look at the pollution prevention hierarchy, but we look at the size of the basket of materials. How many different types of materials are in the basket? How many local end markets are we able to service in order to avoid the continuing problems that exist as a result of things like the China ban? How do we adopt material specific targets? And how do we design systems that have the financial incentives and the financial disincentives to pursue those kinds of targets? In each of our categories, we exceed all Canadian uh, numbers uh, for comparable systems in this country. We also do, because of our integrated supply chains, compare ourselves to the United States, not only in terms of the cost of systems, which is the traditional way for businesses to look at these kinds of obligations, but on the environmental impact of what it is that we're trying to do. We look at recovery rate and we look at accessibility, for example, as key features of what it is that we think programs should deliver. And those are very important to us because consumers are telling us that they need these problems dealt with. Industry should be in the lead in designing and implementing the programs to address that challenge. The essentials of an effective EPR program for us involve making sure that we have an agreed set of core, core principles, that the roles and responsibilities of the key players is not only clearly understood, but enforced. And then we need to make sure that we have the right components for a robust EPR framework. We believe that full responsibility, both financial and operational, is necessary in order to make progress in this area. Only by assigning full operational responsibility and therefore financial responsibility can we begin to design systems that have scale, that have synergy, and that are designed specifically to create markets for recycled materials. This is a leading point up to the point where we will decide always that the green solution, the recycled solution, the circular solution will always be the cheapest solution. And it is only by designing systems in this manner that we will be in a position to adopt that kind of framework. 
Moreover, we need all of these kinds of programs to be easy and convenient, not only at residential areas, because increasingly we're going to have to be looking at the ICNI markets as well. And governments, as they think about regulations, are beginning to step gingerly into these territories. We need to make sure that materials pay their own way. There can't be cross subsidization in this area. Otherwise, materials that should exit a market don't exit, and materials that should grow in their prominence in markets don't grow. And we believe also that we should have healthy competition in the procurement of services. This is essential to the creation of effective, competitive, and cost-effective markets everywhere. The roles and responsibilities for each of the actors in this area, and many, many of my colleagues are quite familiar with how it is that we line up roles and responsibilities. But it is absolutely critical in our experience in this country, whether we're speaking of the federal government, provincial governments, or municipalities themselves. The governments are there to set clear objectives, priorities, and targets. It is no more the preserve of governments to actually operate programs in this area. They need to give the private sector the opportunity to innovate, to synergize, and to create the markets of scale that will allow us to make progress in this area. Municipalities, of course, everywhere, have a clear role in the collection interface with residents. Sometimes they also service elements of the ICNI markets as well, but they have a continuing interest. And should they have a continuing interest in pursuing a role in EPR, we should facilitate that in the commercial world in which they wish to operate. Businesses and producers, however, need to take the lead. It is our responsibility as businesses. It is our responsibility as the producers of the packaging and paper that is entering the marketplace to ensure that we are creating the right markets in this area. We believe in this country, even though we are a loose federation, that harmonization is a clear component of a robust EPR framework. We believe that you can achieve that by respecting jurisdictional differences between, say, the federal and provincial governments, but ensuring that each of the jurisdictional components comes to the table to support each other in the creation of the right kind of program. Obviously, this needs to be outcome-based, not input-based. We need to ensure that all outcomes that we care about, recycling rates, the right targets, the right costs, the right accessibility, the right materials, those should be the framework for how it is that we think about policy objectives. There needs, of course, to be oversight. And we've experienced this in different jurisdictions, but the importance of oversight in oversight ensures adequate and competent resources are available to ensure that these markets are developed in an appropriate, competitive, transparent manner. And finally, we need time for program development. One of the things that our friends in government are not as good at, and we chide them periodically for this, is they're not very good at understanding the difference between the date of a regulation and the date of the operation of a program. It is very important that we design these programs thoughtfully, that we have time to create the commercial and other interfaces that are required in order for these programs to be successful, and that the actors design their systems and provide the infrastructure and assets that cannot be done overnight. Finally, we are moving our way towards a circular economy. Now, while that terminology is emerging as a relatively new concept, I believe that we are going to be hearing more and more in the months and years and decades ahead about how it is that we need to manage all aspects of our commercial lives through a circular economy lens. I think we all understand not only the limits of the planet, but the limits of our consumption habits that have developed over a number of decades. And it is essential that EPR form part of the framework of how it is that we think we will move towards a waste-free society. All jurisdictions, all businesses and all citizens have a role to play in how it is that we will recirculate materials, decouple economic growth of cons and consumption from finite resources, how we will provide businesses with a stream of resources at the cheapest possible prices in order to ensure that circularity. 
and that we will stimulate the appropriate modern investment in the systems and infrastructure that we're going to need in the decades ahead. This will be based on our commitment to reduce the use of virgin materials, waste, and therefore reduce emissions. All of this will be tied to the climate change agenda, the, uh, the fight against climate change. We cannot escape that. It will be part of our future. So with that, I wanna say thank you very much to Iswa, to Joachim, and to Scott for the opportunity to present to you today. And I am hoping that as we move towards the end of this program, there will be questions and comments and an opportunity for us to have an appropriate dialogue. Thank you. Thanks a lot, dear John. Very, very interesting, uh, interesting to understand uh, the benefits that you see in full producer responsibility. And so it's it's quite quite good, I think, uh, that we are moving now to Italy, where we have a shared responsibility approach with also i think some some very good learnings and good results so i will pass the floor to to amanda fuso nerini which is the who is the international ma manager within conai and who is a board member of expa as well so very knowledgeable not only about the italian system but also about many other approaches as well amanda the floor is yours thank you Thank you. Thank you, Joaquin. And thanks to all to attend this conference. I'm happy to share with you our um, our system. The name is CONAI. It's the Producer Responsibility Organization of Packaging for Italy. And first of all, uh, as already we have seen with the previous uh, presentation, we have to start from the uh, legal framework. This is the context, the context on what we, uh, what we are working and, and is affected by historically um, role and responsibility of the different stakeholders that are uh, working into our national country. So the first of all, the system is of uh, CONAI uh, is a private system because we are owned by packaging producer and packaging user. And we are uh, a no-profit um, consortia, extended producer responsibility organization that has been established by a national legislative decree. So we are, um, uh, we have a, a, a been set up at national level and we have, um, we have, uh, um, uh, we have uh, an, an article specifics that has been approved by our uh, um, a ministry decree. Um, we are member of EXPRA since many years, since the beginning. And um, secondly, uh, is that this the legal framework uh, start uh, exactly uh, when uh, the first packaging package waste directive has been published by the European Commission. So we were uh, we are active since 1994, and the legislative decree was uh, published and set up in the system in 1997. We see here the list of the implementing act at national level and transposing act since the last one that has been uh, published in September which is the legacy degree number 116, and that has transposed the new um, uh, packaging, packaging waste directing and the waste framework directing as amended in uh, two years ago, so in 2018. So after the legal framework, uh, how uh, we are working as a private and public partnership. We are, uh, private because we are owned by, as I told you before, uh, the packaging producer and the user and our member are uh, almost 800,000 obliged company among uh, packaging producer and user. We are uh, nominated in, a, we have also a board um, uh, that is representing all this uh, obliged company 
and one of the member of the board of the so the Kunai shareholder is is uh, also the uh, a representative of the ministry and so it's nominated by the authorities by our government and it will represent consumer so we have a full representation of all stakeholders in our in our board the um, the shareholders of Kunai are um, mainly uh, in terms of, of number are mainly a uh, packaging user but in terms of uh, weight uh, packaging place on the market weight uh, volume are the packaging producer this has been made but for purpose because our um, uh, financing system and commitment is to uh, achieve the recycling uh, targets for all packaging placed on the market. So how this can happen is through um, um, uh, uh, achieving the, 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 the recycling targets that has been set at national level and are the same that we have um, uh, that the European Commission has established at European uh, level. We have increased a little bit the targets in 2008 uh, of wood and plastics, and you can see that the stage of play of the Kunai um, uh, packaging waste management system is has achieved the re uh, results that are close to the new targets that has been set up by the law for 2025 and in some case for some material we, we are very close also for of uh, reaching targets of uh, 2030 the the system has first of all uh, financial roles uh, as i told you before we are um, uh, setting the fee and the fee are a, a self financial financial system that is eco-modulated, uh, so it's an environmental contribution because we are not for profit and is um, defined and according to recyclability requirement and reusability requirement. The system is um, uh, uh, defined uh, define the fee and, and the fee uh, are uh, based on uh, material specific so and according to the weight of uh, packaging uh, material placed on the Italian markets. Uh, we have euro per ton then and are modulated according uh, recyclability so we have modulated fee for paper uh, packaging um, and plastic packaging. The modulation is also uh, based also in case of uh, reusable packaging as, and we have specific uh, re, um, factor to reduce uh, the fee amount and, and this is happened for um, wood, for pallet wood and for some uh, plastic crates, plastic baskets and glass bottle. This is an open um, a solution for several other uh, uh, reusable packages, but they have to demonstrate that they are under a verified and controlled uh, uh, loops uh, of reuse uh, system. In um, uh, about the uh, operational activity, uh, the CONAI system is uh, um, works through the coordination of the CONAI, the umbrella organization, of the coordination of uh, the material uh, packaging material consortia. We have one material consortia for each um, uh, of one material consortia for each uh, type of packaging material. We have. Chial for aluminium, Comieco for paper, Rilenio for wood, Corepla for plastic packaging, Coreva for glass packaging, and Recrea for uh, steel uh, packaging. We are uh, um, an integrated system also with the independent and uh, individual uh, producer responsibility organization uh, that are uh, has been uh, set up to uh, for um, specific uh, uh, commercial and industrial packaging like um, uh, conip uh, for crates plastic crate and plastic 
palette or a power for a H, um, a ADP, HDP or LB uh, plasting uh, films. And um, lastly, uh, with the uh, uh, new uh, um, um, re producer uh, recovery organization for PT bottle, uh, namely uh, Corbett. Uh, all of them have to report to the authority and to Kodai the um their uh, data on what is placed on the market and the uh, results they have achieved achieved and conrai has the responsibility to report all the data to um to the um, to the uh, to the public and to the authority that's why we every year we have uh, we publish our uh, national yearly report on the packaging prevention measure adopted by the system and the results achieved in the different um, area. Uh, we are um, a business model that is based on the shared, uh, shared responsibility pr principle with all the sick order. Uh, so as we are um, representing uh, uh, the industry of producing packaging, and, and or using packaging, uh, we are not waste management operators. So uh, the, um, the shared responsibility is uh, with the local authority, so the municipality that are uh, the knowledge and they are responsible for the separate collection of uh, packaging and uh, municipal waste in, in, in Italy. And in, we have um, uh, every five years, we um, have an agreement at national level with the association of the, all the Italian municipalities, namely ANCI, that define uh, the take back of the separately collected packaging material and the, um, um, the uh, remuneration, so the compensation fee, according to the quality and the quantity of material um, they are uh, collected separately. It's a business model because it's it's the the financial is on the um, additional cost, so we pay the extra cost uh, necessary to implement separate collection uh, versus uh, mixed waste. Uh, collection and the um, and according to uh, uh, the quality of the collection uh, uh, to be suitable for the next step that is the sorting and the recycling process of packaging material. The the agreement is among uh, Conai and and the material consorts all together. And the, uh, after the general part of the uh, agreement, there are annex with specific detail uh, on uh, how the municipality can sign the agreement for each material. The agreement is and the annex are voluntary, so the local authority can choose uh, the better solution according also to the economy uh, situation and the market situation if to be part of the agreement, so to delete if deliver the separately collected package material to the CONI system or to go on their own self into the free market. But we have the, uh, in any case, we, uh, we are um, uh, endorsed by the law to achieve uh, and to uh, collect all the uh, data on sorting and recycling by all the um, uh, facilities and the operators uh by um, to 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 give to a full picture of the state of play of uh packaging uh collection recycling uh, to to the authority so how we do this in practice this is an example of uh the uh, um of the minimum and maximum uh compensation fee level according to the quality of the material uh, per type of material. We have just signed in, uh, the new agreement, the general part of the new agreement, because the, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, we are in, in the new five years uh, steps of the new agreement. And, but the annex has been signed now only for some type of packaging because the new implementing law is, is, um, is um, affecting the, the negotiation, of course, of the, of the new agreement. But um, the principle is, uh, will be uh, uh, always uh, 
to uh, support and to as much as possible uh, the local authority to take back the uh, the packaging sample they collected according to uh, the quality of the material. And um, next to this slide, we have also uh, uh, one of the only key parts of the activity of the extended producers' uh, res uh, responsibility uh, service that is also related to uh, the eco-design of packaging. CONAI has worked since the beginning to support their obliged company to be in compliance with the um, essential requirement of packing place on the market. We have always uh, support and delivered uh, tools to our member and also uh, define program and awards to um, help them to design their packaging uh, in according to um, a list of um, requirements like uh, saving raw material, reusability, use of recycled material, optimization of production process, sim simplification of packaging system, logistic optimization, facilitated recycling, and, and to do that, we have put in place tools with, it means eco-design tools based on, li on si simplified life cycle assessment that help a company to um, understand if when they are optimizing their packaging according to the requirement uh, that have the main goals to reduce the environmental impact of packaging they place on the market and to achieve, help us to achieve the recycling target on behalf of them, uh, the tool is um, support them also to understand if the, um, when they apply the requirement and their results in terms of uh, water consumption, energy consumption, and CO2 emission is, uh, is, um, is um, reduced as well. Uh, uh, so we are able with this tool to, um, uh, to uh, give also uh, an, um, an addresses and advice to the company if they are going in the right direction. Uh, because uh, uh, circular economy and circular packaging are most than uh, recyclable packaging. First of all, we have to have an, bear in mind that uh, packaging have a service role in uh, within his products. So um, every every part uh, of the uh, the packaging uh, service and performance should be assessed uh, carefully and in, in a comprehensive and a holistic approach. So uh, this this is one of the tool. This tool is used also to assess uh, the um, and, and and define the winner of our uh, prevention awards. It's uh, it's a tender that uh, Conai uh, have every year to their uh, national uh, members, um, putting um, available uh, five hundred uh, thousand uh, euro. Uh, to be um, delivered to the winner of the uh, of the award according to uh, the results of the life cycle assessment. So every every requirement that is applied by the company when they are the eco design or redesign their packaging according to each requirement, they earn some points and according to each point they are um, they get uh, they have back some uh, money. So a real uh, check. So we offer other service on, of course, on uh, recycling. We have a, a public platform, uh, namely uh, www.projetarecyclo.com, that uh, publish the uh, design for recycling guidance that we use also as a main reference to uh, support company to uh, uh, regarding um, the three modulation approach and, and criteria adopted. So the, the design for recycling guidelines are, uh, are drafted in, in, in a consultation, public consultation process, and they are updated according to the national and European news available uh, in, 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 in time. Uh, currently, we have on the website the design for recycling for plastic, aluminum, and, and paper. Then we have also a help desk to support company on all the information uh, regarding the compliance of their packaging place on the market uh, 
uh, uh, for uh, the uh, European Packaging Waste Directive and the National uh, Transposition Law. Um, last last issue we have on that is about labeling. We have just then published a tool that helps a company to how to label properly their packaging according to the new mandatory uh, provision we have on uh, material identification uh, system uh, of, of packaging with the aim to improve the collection, the recycling, uh, sorting and recycling of them, and as well the uh, um, uh, inform consumer about the uh, av um, available uh, collection system in, in place. So this is uh, how the system uh, works. And, and, and the system has been uh, really designed to be um, a, a tool to have a, a circular packaging uh, uh, economy. And it's really what I will call uh, uh, a packaging circular economy in action because it's based on the key pillar of the, of the circular economy. So um, econo using economic lever and our eco tool and our into the first stage that is design phase we have economic liver and equal to our also for the distribution phase and the collection phase we have uh, several engagement about among citizen and authority to to have all in into the process and as a base um, approach the public and private partnership among all the stakeholders so all information are available in our public reports that uh, the latest uh, available in English is the uh, uh, Green Economy Reports with data of 2008. So I invite you to have all the um, uh, more details on how we work and by uh, have a look into, into our reports. So then happy to answer to all the questions you have, you may have on our system. And thanks Joaquin to pass the floor. Okay. Thanks a lot, the Amanda. I really have to say that Konai is, is, is one of the front runners in the ad additional services uh, for companies and and for the other st stakeholders. That's really always inspiring to to follow, to try to follow what you are you and your co colleagues are do are doing. Uh, thank you. Um, finally, from the pure system presentations, I would like to move to Bulgaria now. now. Uh, my my friend. Uh, Mihail will give the presentation. They are uh, in a competitive environment. So one additional layer of complexity to the normal ch ch challenges. So uh, I'm, I'm very curious to, to learn more uh, how you are managed to, to survive and still uh, deliver a lot of good and positive results. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, dear Joachim. Uh, good afternoon to everyone from Sofia, Bulgaria. My name is Mikhail. I'm responsible for the customer care in uh, Ecopac Bulgaria. And uh, thank you to our uh, kind hosts. Uh, I have the privilege to introduce the EPR implementation in Bulgaria, and in particular, uh, the way that uh, Ecopac is uh, running business. Um, as you can see, I have put on my master slide the uh, popular hierarchy of the, uh, from our uh, waste directive, the reduce, reuse, recycle. And I've put uh, one more thing with exclamation mark that we think here in Bulgaria, and this is how we run business here, that uh, the only way to achieve the reduction, reusability, recyclability, and the whole circularity of the economy is by changing the mindset of of all the stakeholders that are engaged in the process. So the rethink part is something that we, we have very strong focus on. The operating model, so this is valid for the entire country. We have uh, five uh, packaging recovery organizations here. Uh, Ecopac is, has always been the, the leader with 40% uh, market share. Um, the other uh, four, um, four organizations are dividing the rest uh, 60%. Uh, in, uh, in a nutshell, the same idea, but in fact, a uh, whole different story. So, um, 
practically we have very very easy model here in bulgaria all organizations are uh, by law known for profit they are all licensed for all kinds of materials and all of them are licensed both for household and commercial industrial packaging uh, one more thing is uh, uh, that is very interesting is that um, the PRO owns the material due to the fact that it uh, pays 100%, covers 100% of the capital expenditures and the operating expenditures of the systems. This means that uh, all the established uh, separate collection systems, their servicing, the sorting, the transportation, everything is covered by the organization. So we have actually two, um, two flows of, uh, of income. One is from the license fees that uh, the obliged industry is paying to us. And the other one is from the uh, selling of the acquired packaging material. Of course, like uh, in all the other uh, countries and organizations, uh, the, st the main stakeholders are uh, the state, and the business from the state part we have the ministry of environment as uh, regulating all the processes issuing the licenses and monitoring the the smooth running of the business and also the municipalities in bulgaria all municipalities with population above 3000 inhabitants must be covered by separate collection systems the other part is the business and uh, the business there are two cases for the business one is the packers fillers importers producers that put on the market uh, packaged goods they have to recycle certain part of it this is the extended producer responsibility and the business that occupies some uh, commercial area office area warehouses they are obliged to provide separate collection systems so uh the market share in Bulgaria is calculated based on the license fee by every uh, by the license volumes of every organization. So Ecopac uh, has 40% of the total market in terms of packaging lic licensed in our system. That's why we have 40% uh, market share. The regulator in uh, represented by the Ministry of Environment gives us additional uh, requirement based on our market share we have to uh, cover with corresponding percentage the population of uh, the country so 40 percent uh, of our uh, population 2.8 2.9 million inhabitants must be covered by ecopac this means that in the different areas of the country different PROs are operating but uh, here ends the the good stuff and the, the easy part because some of the biggest cities in our country we have three very big cities which are divided uh, in regions and in those big cities it is allowed for two or more organizations to operate in the different regions of this city, meaning that the capital city of Sofia, which is something like one quarter of the total population, is divided between uh, three, three operating uh, organizations. The differences between the, the, the different organizations is uh, represented not only in Bulgaria like this, it's, it's the same across Europe. In Europe, from uh, 30 countries, for example, half of them are single operator, monopoly, like Konai in Italy, and half of the countries have competition, including Bulgaria. All of those countries, and also in Bulgaria, um, the, com the competitors on the market are actually uh, a circle of uh, waste management companies, recyclers, uh, landfill operators, packaging um, um, sorters or whatever, 
they are making an organization in order to to make profit because okay by law they are uh, obliged not to distribute profit and dividends but actually when they are serviced by their own companies uh you you get the picture another uh very big difference between our model and uh, the competition model is not only we we are 100 percent owned and run by the obliged industry. We have 17 shareholders, which are only packers, fillers, pro, uh, packaging producers, and another seven companies, again, big uh, locals and multinationals are sitting in our board. So 100% of all our operations are run by more than uh, 70, 80 subcontractors in terms of uh, sorters and uh, recyclers. One very big uh, difference also is that uh, we have invested and we own all of our 16 sorting clients um, and uh, the, other, the other competitors are, uh, are making their sorting on their subsidiaries or uh, mother companies basis. And uh, one very big final difference is, for example, as you can see on the screen, divided by the red uh, vertical line, on the left is our system with uh, three color beans, uh, with um, our branded trucks, where you can see that uh, the yellow branded uh, top, top middle of the, of the screen the branded truck is uh, servicing uh, the corresponding color of containers. All our other organizations are running their business with two container systems, one for glass, the green one, and all the rest is separated in the yellow bin. We have a separate bin for the, for the paper and cardboard. As I already mentioned, in some cities like in Sofia, in different regions, uh different organizations are running this and when we are making our awareness campaigns when we go to the schools when we teach which packaging has to go in which uh, bin the confusion is uh, already there because uh, at school they have three bins at uh, their uh, at their residence they have two bins this is those are the channels uh, from which we acquire uh, our recyclable materials the the one at the bottom with the red uh, rectangular those are our separate collection systems and here we we have put our curbside beans the servicing our, of our uh, horeca projects uh, our door-to-door -door collection all those projects that are giving us something like 20, around 20% 20 of our uh, material that we need to uh, acquire and give for recycling. The, the middle part is the commercial and industrial uh, channel from which we are acquiring something like 30%. And we have another phenomenon that uh, most of your countries uh, do not have. We are unique in this. We have a um, very strong, um, how to say, parallel structure in terms, unofficial structure, and namely uh, those uh, street pickers. Uh, poor guys that are um, uh, stealing our materials from the, from the bins, then they are giving it uh, to um, collection points, those brokers of recycling, and half of our material, we have to uh, buy it back because it was already stolen by the informal sector. Uh, in Bulgaria, uh, most of your countries, your collection points are outside of the cities, but in, in Bulgaria, in every city, you have a lot of three things. One is casino, one is pharmacy, and one is collection points. So practically you can, uh, you can return anything you want to those collection centers and they give you some small small amounts of, of money um, for the as you can see we have uh, very close um, prices with our competitors 
and very big difference uh, versus the state fees. The Ministry of Environment has a subsidiary to which you have the option as a producer or uh, importer to, to pay directly and to report your quantities directly to the state. Uh, no one actually does this. By law, you have three options to pay to the state. No one actually does it besides some very small micro entities. To, to join a PRO, which is 99% uh, the eligible choice of the industry, and to, to act as a known organization, uh, which means to conduct some awareness, to cover some uh, population. Again, no one does this. And uh, we will be having, as you can see, our fees and our reporting is divided by the most common uh, fractions of, of materials. If we would like to go to um, some modulation and, for example, introducing a separate uh, fee for PET plastics, as example, uh, then um, it will be very difficult because, for example, only Ecopac uh, uh, requires from its member to, to give a breakdown, a very detailed breakdown of their packaging. For example, produced versus imported, one way or returnable, uh, type of plastic, type of composite. All other organizations uh, have very simplistic uh, reporting uh, tools and over there you put plastics and that's it. So uh, in order to, to make some further modulation on our fees, we will be needing some governmental uh, guidelines and some level playing field for, for, all, for all players. Otherwise it will not be possible. Uh, so, we have a very big uh, uh, problem with uh, online sales, but I think the distance sellers, I think that uh, this is a common um, problem across, across, the, across Europe and across the world. Um, our total market is officially reported as 400,000 tons of packaging put on the market. Our estimations are that at least another 25 to 35% is some kind of form of uh, a free riding, meaning the distance selling, uh, some wrong uh, reporting, lower reporting, or uh, something like this. In the last version of our Waste Management Act, which uh, was published in 2012, there was included a very um, interesting uh, article that the ministry will choose an independent auditor who will uh, check the whole way, the whole route of the, of the waste, meaning all the PROs, all the sorters, all the recycling, and up to 5% of the obliged industry. Eight years have passed, we still do not have any auditor and uh, what we can do for our clients is to give our consultations, type of uh, very friendly and detailed audit in order they to, to be fully compliant. But uh, all the checks and uh, all the sanctions are in the hands of, uh, of the ministry. Our license is issued for five years, but every year we have a monitoring process and we undergo both financial and environmental audit, which is submitted to the minister. And then after he issues his order with which he ratifies the completion and fulfillment of the target for the past year. On this slide, you can see the development of the market in terms of uh, put on the market and recycled tons by us. This is only for Ecopac, this is 40% of the market. And down below in the table, you can see that for the last seven years, we had uh, those percentages as uh, targets 
for uh, collection and recycling. We have overachieved all of the targets and uh, we, we really believe that we are in strong shape in order to, to meet what is coming with the CEP and SUP directives. Uh, still no transposition in Bulgaria. We are waiting uh, for the circular economy package to be transposed till the end of this year in order to have the new targets as of uh, January 1st, 2021. And uh, what we already know from the public hearings and uh, the discussions is that uh, both directives will be transposed in, in this uh, manner, which is, uh, I would say, uh, step by step with, without any drastic, uh, uh, drastic new moments. And uh, it is, uh, totally achievable. We will have some uh, issues with the uh, aluminum because it's, it's very, even, even in these days, it's, uh, it has very big price. And as I already explained with uh, the activity of the informal sector, it's difficult to, to find even one can in, in our 20,000 bins. We work in 100 municipalities with something like 20,000 uh, beans. So uh, finally, uh, I'm going to our favorite part. I think that uh, this is the key and we are very active in this. This is something that only we are doing, of course, because the other guys are doing it for profit. We are very active in um, the awareness campaigns. We have managed to conduct uh, 15 national and more than 100 uh, local campaigns. We have existed for 16 years for most of Europe, for most of Western Europe. Those processes are uh, 10 years more because the directive was uh, um, accepted by the European Commission in 94. We have transposed this legislation in 2004. So we are halfway there, but we have uh, made a lot of things. Even this bus in the middle of the picture, I'm giving an example, managed in four years to uh, go and to popularize the benefits of the separate collection systems to 150,000 pupils in more than 500 schools and kindergartens. And this even uh, brought us uh, second place in the ISWA Awards. I think it was 2013 or 2014. And we are making also a lot of uh, joint initiatives together with our uh, biggest members. Everyone using their own means, their uh, shops, their uh, wagons, their vehicles. And uh, we strongly believe that uh, this is the way forward. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to, to your questions and uh, stay safe. Yes, thank, thank you so much, dear Mihai. I, I think you, you raised two, two very important topics uh, during your, your, your presentation, which I would like to, to, to highlight to highlight uh, the challenge how to apply fee modulation within a competitive system. And this is uh, really uh, something which has not been answered yet. yet. And uh, even the consultants of the European Commission who spend a lot of uh, uh, efforts and pages on the question of fee modulation, uh, a, lo a lot of uh, big part on the fee future modulation which might be available in 10 year, years but unfortunately they did not spend too much brain how this can be solved uh, within a competitive approach and even uh, within the German c c c system the proposal of uh, DSD and the others is to move this level up to a special uh, central en entity to mo modulate the fees on top of the usual fees. So uh, quite interesting to see how this will develop uh, in the next year years. And of course, the, the challenge of online sales, I think this is a challenge for all EPR systems, not only for 
packaging, but uh, for all the waste streams. And we have joined forces with the we sector, the lightning sector, the tires and the batteries. And we call uh, uh, for the solution that the platforms are made mi minimum co-responsible to, to comply with the EPR legislation. Just this as a side no note, because Mihai mentioned it. Uh, now, now moving to Scott, Scott the, the picture in the US. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we are still missing a lot of EPR for packaging in the U US, although I think the challenge uh, for your inhabitants, for your municipalities and your uh, waste management sector is very similar to the one in Europe, in Canada and all over the world. So. Uh, Perhaps there, there might be a atmosphere change in the few, few future if finally uh, there's a democratic president. I, I don't know if. Let's see what will happen. And I pass the floor to Baltimore at the moment, I, as, as far as I remember. Thank you very much, Joachim. This is Scott Cassell. I'm the CEO and founder of the Product Stewardship Institute. Um, I first want to express my appreciation for ISWA, particularly uh, Leone and Alan, for their excellent work um, in all the webinar series that we've had, and this one as well. Um, and I want to thank Joachim um, in Expra uh, for his leadership throughout Europe um, on these issues and also for sponsoring this series. Um, I don't take this for granted. We shouldn't take this for granted, these sponsorships. Um, it allows us in the Product Stewardship Institute to take these wonderful presentations um, from Michal, uh, Amanda, and John, um, the best practices from various places around the world, and to bring them to our own geographies. And that's what PSI's efforts have been in this webinar series, is to be a bridge um, for this, this great work that's been done around the world um, and expertise on EPR uh, for our sake uh, and in our case um, in the United States. Uh, so for those that don't know us, we're a, a national nonprofit organization. Uh, we've been working to build the capacity for product stewardship and EPR in the United States for the past 20 years. We have uh, membership from 47 of the 50 states in the government agencies, as well as hundreds of local governments, as you see on the logos to the left. Uh, and we also have uh, over 100 partners, mostly businesses, uh, but also universities, organizations, environmental groups, and international governments. Um, and I wanna highlight John's excellent work uh, throughout Canada uh, at CSSA, also one of our uh, very close partners. <clears throat> I just want to give some context to uh, what I'm going to talk about. You've heard best practices. Unfortunately, uh, I have no best practices on EPR laws from the U.S. because we don't have any laws yet on packaging. Um, but as you see here, we have passed 119 EPR laws plus 10 other uh, bottle bills here in the United States on 14 products in 33 states. Most of the activity has been on the West Coast and in the Northeast. But as Joachim was alluding to, uh, there is um, activity in about a dozen states which have either introduced EPR for packaging and paper products legislation in the past year or two, or are right now developing them in serious discussions. Uh, these are the acronyms for the states. Um, there's too many to write them all out here, Good, uh, thank goodness. Um, and a lot of activity on the West Coast and uh, in the Northeast, including Maryland. There is uh, federal legislation that has also been introduced um, called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Uh, it's branding and messaging was on plastics, but it does cover all different materials. It was introduced in February of this year. It's a comprehensive proposal. It has uh, EPR for packaging at its core, but it also has a national bottle bill, a bag ban and fee, and it has other bans on other single-use plastics. Now, one of the things we do at the Product Stewardship Institute is to develop policies and 
EPR legislation. Uh, we do this for all the different products. We work on over 25 different products, including packaging for the past 15 years. Packaging has been on our agenda. Um, and what we've done is to develop a tool that we call legislative elements for uh, of EPR for packaging in this case. We do it for mattresses, paint, carpet, uh, pharmaceuticals, all the different products. We have a framework for discussion. We break down each of these products and packaging down to about 20 different elements, in this case, 19 for packaging. For example, what are the covered materials? What are the covered entities? Meaning where are these materials collected from? How do you define a responsible party? Um, how is the stewardship organization uh, governed? Uh, what's the funding mechanism? Are there performance standards? How are those set out? What are the convenience standards and so forth? And so what we do is that to break it down so we have a discussion just on each one of these elements at a time. They sometimes cross to different elements, but it's a way that we can focus on our discussion. Um, seem to have lost the, uh, can you see the presentation? There it is, all right. <laughs> I think someone's playing tricks on me. Um, so the this is the, the framework that we've used and um, we break it down into each different element and then we have discussions. So what we've done in the US is develop a um, a, a whole comprehensive elements document um, uh, for the 19 elements with our U.S. state and local experts around the country. We have many, many um, experts that are developing these bills um, around the country. We bring them together and we've gotten consensus from them. So for example, this element is covered materials. We figured the base model is our best practices. We learn from what you're hearing here in Europe in Canada, and then we translate this information to what we think as a unified body, what we think the best practices are in the US, but we also have options and additional considerations so that each state can weigh in based upon its political aspects, um, culture and other um, things like, do they include uh, commercial in with the residential? We have taken this model um, to work with the Flexible Packaging Association. Uh, we have a long history working with some of the members there and the leader um, uh, of FPA. Um, we have developed uh, some agreements over the past year with them. We started with getting an agreement on the beneficial attributes of flexible packaging. We came to an agreement on the problem statement, multifaceted problem statement the desired end state, where we want to be, the attributes of that system, like sustainable financing, um, and also eight key elements of a packaging EPR bill that the FPA felt were most relevant to them. They're not all the brand owners, but they are converters and other producers. And so we reached agreement, state and local governments with two recyclers, uh, and two uh, prominent statewide environmental groups. The key issues that we're coming across, as you're probably hearing here, I'm just gonna outline them in primary colors. Uh, one is a full versus shared financing. You know, How much is it that the producers are going to pay into the system? Uh, the second one is the roles and governance. Uh, this is one that is uh, very much of interest to municipalities, as well as haulers and material recycling facilities. Who's making the decisions on how that money is spent? Uh, what is the governance of the stewardship organization? Uh, should there be an advisory board? And what should the makeup be? Uh, what's the role of the state in its government and enforcement? And what are the options given for the local governments? These are the negotiations that we're having in every single state. And it leads to what John um, and laid out very nicely, which is uh, the transition that Canada is going through from municipal reimbursement, which here you see on the right, which gives more of the 
day-to-day -day management to the municipalities, also the haulers, the MRFs, there's less change involved there. It's reimbursing for the system. But as Amanda and Michal mentioned, that there are, uh, there are levers around how to reduce contamination and increase the quality of the materials. But it has moved towards the full EPR. So we're having this discussion in the US, where can we start with? Can we move right away to full EPR? Do we need to start with municipal reimbursement? Should there be a transition period? What should that transition period be? How do we work this out? This again is part of the negotiations that every state is undertaking. And finally, um, to touch on one of our previous webinars, modulated fees is important. Uh, we're at the infancy here. We've learned an awful lot today from our speakers, uh, but the basics are uh, that the material fees are based on materials, the weight, or in sometimes uh, the units, and the net recycling costs. But we're very aware of the need to move towards these eco-modulated fees, the recyclability, recycled content, uh, less toxics, the litter prevention, um, anything disrupting the system itself, greenhouse gas emissions, um, and resource use in general, giving some uh, credits as well as penalties. So with that, I hand the baton back to Joachim, and I know we have a few minutes here for questions. Thank you. Yes. Thanks a lot, dear, 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 dear Scott. Very appreciated. Yes, uh, as we do not have too much time, let's jump immediately into some some questions. And uh, I wanted to start with John, and uh, uh, there were a few questions on harmonization. And uh, don't, don't take me wrong, but I would like to phrase my question very, very black black and white. What does it mean, harmonization, that you are striving for? Are you trying to turn Quebec into British Columbia, or are you trying to, to ha harmonize those uh, fields uh, where, where there's a po po possibility to align them between the different pro provinces? And what are, are you doing about the, the provinces that do not have a legislation up, up to now? Are you starting voluntary initiatives there, or are you waiting for the government to decide? Thank you, Joachim, and um, the, the question is fine. No, I'm not trying to turn Quebec into British Columbia any more than I would try to turn Alberta into Ontario. Uh, it, there is no need to infringe upon any provincial jurisdiction in any way that there would be in the same same way in Europe, you wouldn't want to infringe in national sovereignty in order to affect a European Union solution, for example. What I'm suggesting to you is that the full producer responsibility theory carries with it two very important elements. One, a regulatory component, which needs to be exercised, we believe, in a combined federal and provincial way. And the second thing is the role of industry to execute against those regulatory principles. When it comes to how it is that the federal and provincial governments in this country cooperate or collaborate, there are distinct jurisdictions. Quebec has its own jurisdiction over the management of recycling systems. That is not to say that in relation to British Columbia, Ontario, Alberta, or any other province or territory in this country that the federal government cannot, working with the provinces, establish a set of national parameters and targets that the provinces can then themselves execute against. I suggest that because in a federation, whether it's a constituted federation like Canada or a republic like the United States or a collection of nationally sovereign institutions such as you have in Europe, there is absolutely nothing that prevents the different jurisdictions from exercising their responsibilities in a collaborative way. We have utterly failed to do that in many, many places. And as a result, we have fragmented disparate systems that fail to create the appropriate markets for the materials that we in business wish to make use of. So I'm suggesting to you that you can have your cake and eat it too when it comes to jurisdictional interconnection and jurisdictional harmonies in that area okay yeah i i can fully understand what you say but uh, uh, as as i was working in the 
German uh, mm -hmm. EPR system in the sure. 90s. Of course, I can tell you that we tried to bring the wisdom to our other countries as, as well. Uh, so on, we on, on, we tried on, we tried it on, and we co completely failed. So uh, <laughs> under, under, understood understood, Joachim. But the 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 very big difference that exists today that we are able to take advantage of is that That's rather right. than a very resistant business community, and I say that with, you know, writ large, rather than having a very resistant and suspicious business community that wasn't ready to actively participate in achieving economic and environmental goals, we now have major businesses everywhere around the world that are more than inclined to participate in these systems in a more effective manner. That's a very big difference than you and I experienced 20 years ago when we were beginning our journeys in this area. Yep, and so it's right. a matter of leveraging that interest, that capability, that infrastructure, and those resources against regulatory capabilities and combining those two in a much more modern framework. If we don't do that, then we won't have learned a lot of what ha has happened in the last 20 years, and we'll still have to be having arguments about this. So. Pretty right. Yo, um, yo, team, if, yes, if I could just jump in and just one comment to tag on to what John mentioned. I, I think we're we're not talking necessarily about regulatory harmonization, the Correct. same in each place, but it's it's harmonization of principles and Correct. and ways of doing things, um, and and of reaching efficiencies and which systems are better and why, and it, it's sharing that information again. Why this webinar series has been so Correct. important. Yeah. Same applies to you, Scott, as it does up here. I don't think California is going to do exactly the same regulatory structure as the state of New York, but as businesses that have to then pick up not only the economic tab, but the environmental consequence of these things. It is in our interest in our sector to make sure that to the greatest extent possible, the regulatory frameworks look very similar to each other. Mm. Yeah. So I think these questions are answered, ho hopefully. Um, a more general questions to, to, to all the three uh, system spe speakers with regard to compostable and bio bioplastic, bio pa packaging. Um, uh, where, where do you see this uh, packaging at, at the moment? Is this a, a way forward? Is this, uh, is this tackled uh, in, in Italy and in, in Bulgaria uh, in Canada or is it left aside at the moment because it's a, a very tiny niche mar market where where do you see these kinds of packaging heading to perhaps start with Amanda if she's with us still yes I'm still with, <laughs> with you I'm still with you so what what uh, the latest um, situation we have is uh... oops no now we lost her uh, perhaps i can give the floor until amanda is uh, back with us to me michai is this something where where ecopack is dealing with at the moment compostable packaging bioplastics or is, is this too niche uh, that that you are able to deal with it it's uh, I would really like to to give more details on this topic. It's very interesting, but uh, we are far from there. that's that's the truth. all All packaging, regardless if they are from hazardous material or they are biodegradable or they are compostable, has to be reported. Uh, the obliged industry has to uh submit them to to the respective PRO but uh, the the matter is not uh, tackled very serious there was uh, two years ago three years ago a very big uh, municipal owned by the state very big uh, factory for uh, recycling of everything including uh, compost and uh, everything made in Sofia but uh, it's uh, it's not uh, running very very smoothly. Mm. So. Any comment from John on this point? Joachim, thank you. Um, yes, I think compostables will have a role to play in this space for two reasons. One, their use is going to continue to grow as we consider how to wean ourselves off of uh, virgin oil and gas 
uh, or fossil fuel um, plastic materials. So I think that use is going to continue to grow. It is not yet at a stage where you can begin to combine a lot of these materials, given the heavy emphasis that we have on mechanical sortation and processing. So I think we're going to have to um, invest more time and invest more resources in studying the capabilities of compostable products and then decide which type of EPR stream these kinds of materials will then be presented uh, into. I'm not sure that we're there yet, but there's no question that there is increasing interest in this area. And I expect that we will at some point be confronting this in a much more material way. Okay, thanks, thanks. Uh, some other questions were related to enforcement. Enforcement, and uh, just a comment from my side. Uh, if you have a look to the minimum requirements for EPR systems in the new legislation in the EU, you can see that a lot of emphasis is on the role of governments as well in monitoring, reporting, and enforcing the EPR. Uh, regulations because we have seen that uh, if you do not enforce the legislation uh, there are a lot of companies and people uh, are not following the legislation uh, perhaps uh, Michai you can comment as well from from you said it already that you still have a lot of probably a lot of free riders uh, in Bulgar Bulgaria and I'm not sure whether your ministry would like to know more about this because more free identifying more free riding means more packaging put on the market which means that the current performance is dropping hmm? so if if i'm a bad guy i would say it's in the interest of a member state of the european union to to have a, lo a lot of free free riders because then your performance towards brussels is better but on the other side your members have to pay much more money to deal yeah. with the packaging of others. So uh, you, you have an interest to, to identify uh, free, 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 free riding. Yeah? yeah, yeah, we have to. And I think this is uh, the, the only way forward because uh, it's not possible um, half of the business to, to pay for, for the whole of the business. Okay, the performance will, will drop, but uh, this is lying, lying to ourselves. I think that it's, uh, mm -hmm. are you seeing some efforts with the new legislation of your government to increase the enforcement to free more stuff to 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 look uh, after the companies or are they still quite reluctant to 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 deal with this challenge I think we we are far from there <laughs> so uh, even uh, even uh, politically it's not very stable the situation we got our uh, environmental minister arrested in the beginning of the year. The, the whole government is three months now with uh, routes and shaking. Uh, so it's, it's not the, the proper uh, environment mm. to, to do this. Mm. Is this organized in a better way in the provinces in Canada? Is there a good monitoring by the government so that you can identify those who are not uh, fulfilling the obligations? Uh, in, in most jurisdictions, Joachim, there is enforcement based on uh, how it is the companies required to register based on the regulatory standard. Uh, yes. That said, uh, one of the challenges that all systems face is a framework of free riding. Sometimes it's structural, sometimes it's just individual uh, entities not uh, participating the way they're supposed to. Uh, a lot of the challenges I expect uh, that we're going to see moving forward with respect to things like free riding are structural, quite frankly, with respect to products mm -hmm. and packaging moving back and forth across borders, particularly in an era such as we're faced with right now, where the amount of online packaging moving across borders is uh, growing. Uh, not only from a, uh, a strong level, but into a very significant uh, position within various economies. Yeah. So, so, so I think this is one of the to topics we have to deal with all together in the future. Future, how to make our ministries fit for the for per for purpose? Some somehow, I get, I guess. Hmm? And 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 I think to that degree, you know, it it is um, very important then to stress how it is that subnational and national governments can collaborate more effectively in this area because these these will become 
just like border carbon adjustments are going to become important trade issues, um, these have the potential to become trade irritants if they're not measured and managed appropriately, I expect. Yeah, fully agree. Thank you. So I'm happy that um, Am Amanda is again w with us, that we didn't totally lo lose her. Uh, as, as I know, as I know that uh, Italy uh, is is also with the question on compostable packaging, yes. one of the front runners. Perhaps you can say a few few, few words to this topic as, as, yes. as well. Yes, uh, yes. From from a waste management point, as you may know, we have separate collection of compostable uh, waste since many many years. We have also. Um, they are part uh, of the uh, contributing to the separate collection targets at national level. And um, from uh, the side of packaging, a uh, requirement to be considered as a compostable, by law, they should be uh, um, uh, designed according to the standard EN uh, 13432. This is our reference, technical reference, to define if the package is in complex to be considered compostable or not. And after that, is asked by uh, the authority to uh, label uh, all packages that are uh, declared compostable that are uh, certified according to this standard. So this is from a technical point of view. In time of governance, uh, the, we just received the um, um, application for the seven uh, extended uh, producer responsibility organization for compostable packaging under under the uh, CUNAI system umbrella. So the, the process is in itinerary. So we are waiting uh, the final uh, approval of the statute into the uh, official uh, journal of uh, Italy. Thanks a lot. Uh, perhaps a final Thank question you. to the three of you before I, gi I give the, the, the word uh, back finally to Scott uh, is regard to, with, to commercial pa packaging because uh, we we mainly discuss our, uh, uh, our household packaging because our inhabitants and citizens are affected, but still usually ha half of the market is uh, uh, commercial pa packaging, half of the one-way ma ma market, I would like to say, because a lot of packaging in the, in the commercial area is already uh, re Reu reusable. Is this something which is uh, okay that we concentrate on household packaging, or should we should should we invest more on the co com commercial side? I know in in in, in Europe that uh, uh, until the Chinese closed the border, a lot of commercial packaging was also going to China, which caused for some countries some problems. Uh, what to do with the commercial packaging? packaging now so so what, what, what is your point of view should we continue to concentrate on household or do we have to invest the same e efforts for our com commercial stream as well hmm. you want me to go first yes please okay dumping our garbage in our neighbor's backyard uh, isn't really something that we should be terribly proud of and it doesn't matter if that garbage is commercial garbage or residential garbage. I think we, we started this journey, Joachim, because the municipal structures enabled us to get easier access to residential packaging, residential paper, and residential wastes. Uh, however, the consumers who are very active in this area and who care very deeply about making sure that things like the plastic pollution problem is solved, they're not going to draw any distinctions between residential packaging and paper or commercial paper and packaging. They want it all solved. And to leave half of the problem out there is not going to actually endear us to them. I think this is going to be happening uh, regardless of whether or not we think a lot about it right now, we are going to be confronting a situation where consumers are going to demand that the balance of this problem get dealt with. And we as businesses better figure it out, whether we're makers, retailers, or members of the waste management industry, we better figure it out or regulators are going to descend upon us with solutions to this problem that we might not actually find 
are terribly helpful. So mm -hmm. it's up to us to get ahead of this particular challenge and acknowledge that the commercial side is equally important to consumers and to citizens uh, as the residential side is. Any comments from Italy or Bulgar Bulgaria for commercial packaging? Italy, from Italy's side, uh, you know that since the beginning, we was responsible for all packing place on the market. So both commercial, industrial and household. From from um, a governance uh, point of view, we uh, when when uh, we put uh, uh, mainly the financial uh, support to uh, household or municipal ways is that uh, because this is the more um, uh, uh, challenge to uh, uh, support the local authority into the SIP, proper SIP collection. But we have always worked to have a network the same network that is used by the local authority to deliver our uh, uh, sorted uh, packaging waste material is the same used and, and offered by our members to deliver free of charge their own uh, industrial and commercial packaging waste material. They, they have uh, a, a pay a fee for that uh, as well as the other packaging, they can deliver free of charge their own packaging to the uh, facilities that uh, are have a contract with the system and and this is on a voluntary option equal to the voluntary option to uh, uh, sign the agreement the national agreement uh, of the for the local authority to um, um, deliver uh, the packaging within the national agreement on on the take back of separate collection so both same approach so voluntary approach and it is up to the waste producer to uh, decide uh, which is the best network they see in terms of economics and operational level to 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 count to guarantee in both cases that the packaging material will be sorted and recycled and recycled means entering into the uh, a loop that produce new products made with recycled contents okay thank thanks a lot thanks a lot to all thanks uh, for I the question yeah, it was, I think, again, a very interesting uh, webinar. Before I give the final floor to Scott, just just to, to say that we are planning uh, to continue this series uh, next year. We still have to finally decide how to organize it in the best way. But perhaps uh, a wish, uh, a, a question to to the to the participants of today, to the audience. Uh, to, to, to send to Scott and me proposals which topics are of interest for for you so that we have a better understanding uh, what what you are interested in before we decide uh, on the topics for ne next year so thanks a lot to all to all of you I think it was an in interesting we we webinar today and Scott you have as usual the final wise words to close this this way webinar. Thank, th thanks a lot, Michai, John and um, Amanda. Great presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Joachim. Yeah, thank you all. Uh, very briefly here, because this has gone on a long time. <clears throat> um, Joachim, uh, you said EPR is uh, not a business plan, meaning that we need to figure this out. Uh, there's basic principles. Uh, John, you said we are all learning as we go. Uh, these are these are comments from people with some of the most experience in the world on these type of systems. I think we all need to recognize that the most important thing is that we engage, that we ask the questions, that we be at the table, that we have conversations about this, uh, and that we recognize that EPR programs are the future. There may be something else that comes later that supplant, supplants it. Um, but we can't be dragging on the sides, and I'm speaking, of course, to uh, those in the U.S. Um, that may not be there yet at the table, but they're coming around. These systems have a framework. Um, there are There's a role for producers, but there is shared responsibility, and it's knitted together through an EPR system, and those systems are evolving as we learn, as we move forward. And they're going to keep doing that. 
and we need to be cognizant of that um, and we can learn from everyone in the world here. Uh, South America, Asia, Europe, Canada, US, we have all something to bring to the table. Um, and we look forward to your suggestions for what you would most like to learn. As Joachim is saying, please submit those to us and we'll consider them and develop a new webinar series for next year. And thank you again to ISPA and EXPRA for being such great partners. And thank you for all of our speakers. Take care.